I was uh, telling our worship team before we were coming out as we were back there praying, I was like, that word Hosanna is only used one time in the Bible, and that's when Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem during Passover. It's pretty awesome. Hosanna. It was a, a word reserved. It was an Aramaic word that they once used to appeal to God to deliver them, to save them. And then it became an exclamatory rejoicing, praising God for delivering and saving them. Amen? It's a pretty awesome thing. So if you want to, real quick, you can turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. I want to read the first four v- verses just to kind of set the tone for our testimony time. And then, like I said, I'm going to turn you guys loose to preach the Word today. This is your chance. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Of course, this is John the Apostle, who John the Beloved, John the Revelator, if you will, who wrote the Gospel of John and also the Book of Revelation, and then he writes his epistles here, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And as you'll notice here, uh, you'll, you'll see how it uh, sort of converges or reminds you of how he opens his Gospel. How does John open the, his Gospel? Do you remember? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was... God, and the Word was with God, was with God and was God, right? So he, this is what he, he says it again, man. I mean, John, he can't get over the fact that the Logos, the living Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. He, he, he doesn't stop. It, it rejoices him every time he thinks about it. What was from the beginning? What was from the beginning? We just talked about it. The Word, right? Jesus Christ. What, now listen to, listen to how many times he repeats some of these words. What we have heard... What we have seen with our eyes and what we have looked at. For some reason, he says, we've seen it with our eyes, and then he says, we've looked at it. Okay? It's like this wasn't some fantasy. This wasn't something that we made up. We looked at him in the flesh, in the physical, in the natural realm. The supernatural God, the uncreated God, stepped out of time and space and stepped into our world. John is like, we actually saw him in his beauty and his glory, although many people did not see his beauty and glory. But we, as his disciples, were able to walk and talk with him and witness his miracles, right? Witness his love, mercy. I just love that. What was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, and what we have looked at. And then he says, and touched with our hands. Once again, this is flesh and blood. Jesus could be touched, right? Right? Jesus manifested himself. He he came, right, from the unseen realm into the seen realm, from the unknown realm into the known realm. That's what he did. It's pretty amazing. And John, once again, just can't get over it. We've heard him, we've seen him, we've touched him. And he says, concerning the word of life. Once again, who's the word of life? It's Jesus, right? And the life was revealed. So now he's saying, We didn't just see him physically and hear him and touch him and see some really neat and cool things. This was the word of life. The one who created all things. And he revealed himself as the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Listen to what he says. And because of this, we because he says it again, we have seen, and now he says, we testify. Because we've seen, we've heard, we've touched, he's been revealed to us. Now we can't help but testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was the Father and was revealed, which was with the Father and was revealed to us. Now he repeats it again. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. John is being adamant here over and over. We were witnesses. And what do witnesses do? They testify. And John is saying, we witnessed him, and now we can't help but tell of him. We can't keep it quiet. We're we're not going to keep it a secret, right? John, ultimately to the point of being exiled to the Isle of Patmos, as we talked about. They were going to lock him up. His life was being threatened. You're not going to shut him up. What I've seen and heard and touched and what's been revealed to me, no man is going to strip away from me. I'm not going to operate in the fear of man because I have encountered a true and living God in the form of Jesus Christ. Amen? It gave him boldness. It gave him faith. It goes on. 
we've seen and heard and we proclaim to you also. Why are we doing this? Why are we testifying and proclaiming? Here he says it. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. I wouldn't lie to you. John is excited about this. This is what brings him ultimate joy and fulfillment, to know his God and to make him known. That fills his heart. His heart is alive. It's burning with this. He can't stop him. Nobody could stop him from testifying and proclaiming, right? Now you guys get a chance to do that today, right? It's a pretty awesome thing. So let me give you the definition of these three words, testify, proclaim, and fellowship. Because this is what it's all about. Us in this room, we've also heard and seen, right? And tasted and touched. And so we want to testify and proclaim, and we want to have fellowship. So testify, this word, of course, means to bear witness. Isn't that what Jesus said? I came to bear witness to the truth. And those that are on the side of truth, listen to me. So Jesus came to testify, to bear witness to the heart of the Father. It also means to make a solemn declaration, to establish a fact, to give testimony for the purpose of communicating to others. Here's the reason why we're doing this today. A knowledge of something that's maybe not known to them. That's what it is. I want to tell you some things that maybe I haven't told you about what God's done in my life. I want to reveal Jesus. That's what testifying is about. Now, number two, proclaim. This word actually means to be a herald. Now, what was a herald in that day? This is someone would blow a trumpet, and you would get the daily news. You couldn't turn on cable. You couldn't turn on the satellite. You couldn't stream, right? So you had a herald to come to announce What's going on with the king? Is there a new decree? Is something about to happen? Are we about to gather together for war or about to have a festival? It was a herald's job to make an announcement to all the people, right? That's what we're to do when we proclaim. We're being a herald. We're announcing publicly. It also means to lift up and to show forth. I like that. Isn't that what we want to do with our lives? We want our lives to lift up and to show forth Jesus, right? I mean, that's it. That's the whole purpose. Why we exist is to love Him and to glorify Him and to share Him, right? To spread His gospel with others. It's an agreement. Proclaim also means an agreement and confession. It actually can also mean to cry out. This isn't something to just, you know, okay, guys, Jesus is great, right? No. Like, let's shout about it. Let's cry out. Let's declare it's an announcement. Actually, it's to bear tidings. The other word, testify, to bear witness, this is to bear tidings. And what does the Bible say about that, right? We're to bear glad tidings, right? And that's what the angels came when they came to the shepherds. We have good news, good tidings of great joy for all the earth. That's what proclaiming is about. Does anybody have any good tidings in here today? I hope you do. So we testify and proclaim, and John says the whole point is so that we have fellowship. Fellowship is much deeper than getting together, hanging out, and having a meal, and talking about the big fish that we caught when we went fishing. Right? All that's great. Please do that. Right? It's more than that. All of that's great, and we need that and should cherish that. But fellowship, a biblical definition is this. It's a real and practical sharing in eternal life. First of all, John says, with the Father and Son. That's what he said. We have fellowship with the Father and Son, the Word of life, right? The Eternal One. We are one with Him. We have a real and practical sharing in His life. Eternal life begins now with the Holy Spirit in us, right? The hope of glory, this down payment, this deposit, this treasure we have in earthen vessels, right? Our fellowship, first of all, is with Him through the Holy Spirit. But then second of all, we get to share and participate together. Christ is the head and we are what? The body, right? So we get to share together. That's fellowship is about sharing in communion. All right, what, are, what is the body? What are we as a church? We're, we're a community 
of believers, right? We have a common union. What is that? It's that we're in Jesus Christ, right? We all have a testimony of how we were saved, right, by grace through faith. And we've seen God's goodness and faithfulness throughout our years. Can anybody say yes to that? Thank you, Lord, for this fellowship, this communion that we have with you and with each other. We get to encourage one another, iron sharpening iron. We get to stir one another to love and good works. That's what this testimony time is designed to do, to stir us, to provoke us, to help us increase our faith, to attach our faith, to say, man, what, what an awesome thing God did in that person's life. God, do it in my life, right? When someone testifies, they're actually prophesying. God did this for me, and he wants to do it for you, right? So it's an amazing thing. And so that's what we get to do. We get to engage with 1 John, his desire, his joy. And that's the thing. Really, when we fellowship and we testify and we share with one another, that's when the praise really gets to its fullness, right? That's when our joy can really come forth. It's really not complete. Like, we can be thankful for what God has done and all that, but when we share it, there's another layer. You see what I'm saying? All of a sudden, our joy is expressed, right? And praise can come forth. Is anybody else excited about this? I feel like I'm the only one. Like, I'm alone up here. (laughs) Hosanna in the highest, right? When they were welcoming Jesus into the city, they were going nuts. They were taking off their clothes. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. They were taking off their cloaks and t- cutting off branches off of trees, man. Shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Even blind Bartimaeus, he cried out, have mercy on me, son of David. Are you guys going to let a blind man out shout you and out praise you and out testify today? He had a beggar's cloak on, and what did he do? He threw that thing off. No more, I'm going to Jesus. You think he was quiet? Or did he tell everybody, I once was blind, but now I see. And I can testify with John and the other disciples. (laughs) This is the word of life. Awesome. Well, that's enough preaching from me. So there we go. Uh, I'm going to tell you about my Jesus. Uh, Jesus is all I need. I feel like if I lost everything that's precious to me tomorrow, I'd still have everything I need. God has been so good to me. And Jesus, it's, I love saying that Jesus loved me so much that he went to Calvary for me. He died so I could be treated as if I had lived his life. And he forgave all my sins. He made it possible for me to stand in God's presence just as if I had never sinned in my life I could be looked at like I was completely flawless and that's not all there is Uh, he's made it so that I can live my life and have an abundant blessed life and he is there with me no matter what I go through, uh, the storms I face, the hard times I face, the trials in my life, he's always there. He's never more than a whisper away. And he's coming back. And I can't wait. I just hope I get to see it. But either way, if I don't, I know my destination when I take my final breath, I'm going to stand face to face with Jesus. And I can't wait. Folks, we got a lot to be happy about. Uh, 
You know, this old world anymore, all you hear is bad, bad, bad. So us folks that have Jesus have got to start talking a little bit louder. We got to let people know what God's done for us, what his son has done for us, and what he's going to do for us in the future. Uh, we need to just wipe out this uh, bad talk and uh, uh, all the critical things and all the bad things and be positive. Uh, we've got good news. Let's share it, folks. Let's get out there and share it. God is good, and Jesus loves us and has made the way for us to have eternal life with him in heaven. And if that's not something to shout about, I don't know what is. Hey. Oh, I'm Hello. Okay. Um, well, so we're going to keep it clean and PG, but as a child, the enemy put an assignment on me. He, he came to steal, kill, and destroy really young. And as an underprotected child, I became one of God's most protected children in, for me. So I had um, grew up um, not knowing the Lord at all, really. Uh, I heard things here and there, but I, I did, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that came up in our homes. Um, eventually, oh, I'm shaking, I'm trembling. Uh, <laughs> Because I was bound. That's where I'm going with this. Um, I had made a complete mess of my life uh, doing things uh, Erica's way. Um, around about 15, I created a bigger, stronger, meaner uh, Erica. And uh, along the way, I w my heart became really, really hard. And I was angry. So... Although God was blessing me all through the years, you know, with my children and, and, and things like that and placing people in my life, I didn't know. I didn't know. I was blind. I was blind. I was completely, the scales were so thick that uh, I had no, no understanding whatsoever. So, um, so to move forward a little bit, I had um, begun a drug addiction around the age of 17. Uh, I met a guy. Well, actually, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get up here and lie. I had. I, I was already introduced to the drug before I met the guy. But when I met him, his father was a meth cook. So um, I made the the sound choice to join that family. And I tell I tell everyone right now that is the devil's drug. That's the devil's drug. Um, for around 13 years, I stayed in this marriage. Uh, <laughs> it was like I wasn't allowed to say no. The only two breaks I got was when I was pregnant with my children. And that was because I, with my first child, I ran away to my father's, my dad's house. And uh, he kept me there and kept me safe. And I was able to have my first child right back to the drugs. Right, that was just a part of our lifestyle. And uh, being bound and sin and shame and, you know, um, I just kind of wanted to keep this family together for my kids. You know, my mom, my dad, you know, something I never had, even though it was dysfunctional as heck. Um, but this man, this man, um, my ex-husband, he, he was very abusive. He, um, I, for more terms, uh, he's, he's, he's evil. He's evil. He's very abusive. And... Um, after the last beating, he strangled me unconscious. And he told me he was going to take my two kids, which was 10 and, and 2 at the time, and burn the apartment down on me. And so I woke up in the bathroom floor, and it, the apartment was quiet, and, and I, I made my way out of the bathroom, and my kids were asleep on the couch. And I decided to get them up, and I ran. I ran that day, and I came back home to Palm Bluff. But anyway, I don't want to get too deep into all that. But so I made a mess of my life, and along the way in that addiction, I collected a lot of baggage, a lot of, uh, a lot of shame, and a lot of bondage along the way, uh, creating a lot of different things. 
But I'm going to tell y'all the good news now. So I've been delivered. Last year I got delivered. Last year I got delivered. Um, all it takes is the faith of a mustard seed. All it takes is the faith of a mustard seed because I'm going to show y'all who y'all see today. Like, I wake up, I, my feet hit the floor. He came into my heart and he lit a fire, I'm telling y'all. My feet hit the floor and I just, I just go to praising him. I go to praising him for what he's done for me. I've got probably a million testimonies and I didn't even know where I was going with this. I said I wasn't going to get up here and do this. But I, who am I to not give him the glory, you know what I mean, for what he's done for me. But, um, yeah, that's what I want to say. <laughs> Good morning, y'all. I love my church so much. I'm not going to take that 15 minutes you talked about last time. I'm not going to do it. But I will say, um, I was talking last Sunday. Y'all, I was, a, well, y'all saw, I was a wreck. Um, <laughs> God just overwhelmed me last week. But, and so after church, we were kind of talking about, you know, this Sunday. And I really had not in my life thought about what Palm Sunday was because, you know, I didn't grow up in Jewish tradition. So I didn't really know. I just knew it was something that we acknowledged because it's the Sunday before Easter or Resurrection Sunday, you know. And so it, it's important in the scheme of things, but I didn't understand. So as I do, I did some research. <laughs> and um, just kind of look to see and read about like what that was and what the importance of that was. Jesus entering the city like that and everybody like bowing down to him and throwing those palm branches and throwing their cloaks down and entry for a king is what they were doing. Now, they cried Hosanna, which the, I'm not going to re-preach what he preached. I'm not going to do that. But he talked about um, what Hosanna means and what it meant for them. And so for them, you know, it's because uh, I wrote it down so I won't forget. But it, it means, Lord, save us. So it's, you know, save us, O oh Lord. And they, they had such a reason, you know, they were waiting for this Messiah to come and deliver them from their op oppression and deliver them and conquer, not just take them out of what they were in, but to conquer the people who had been oppressing them. So they were excited for this person, like, oh my God, he's coming in, you know, riding in and everybody's shouting, he has come, he's come. And so they're, they're crying, save us. Thank you for saving us, basically. And what they didn't even know is that shortly after, I don't know how many years, because I'm not a historian, but shortly after that, the Roman Empire ended up failing and being conquered. Jesus didn't have to do that part. That part got done. What they did not know is what he came to save us for and from. And so I thought about that, how they were... They meant what they said, but they had no idea why he came. And just really thinking about that, that, that Jesus came to save me from something I didn't even know I needed saving from. From myself, from sin, from death, hell, and the grave. Like, he conquered all of that. And so I was like, Lord, Palm Sunday is supposed to be a thing for believers. <laughs> Like Erica said, and like Miss Diane said, we should be excited about Palm Sunday. It should be, listen, the resurrection of Jesus is like the thing. So I ain't saying it's, it's bigger than that because that's big. <laughs> Didn't nobody do that. But Palm Sunday should be up there with that. That's the, intro, that's the beginning of all of it. Holy Week is a thing. I got a little printout back there that I'm going to read through this week. So that I can be in a place where I am eternal. I'm so grateful for what he did. Listen, my story is not Erica's story. My story is not other people's story. But I've, I've been delivered from some stuff. I've been delivered from, from my wicked heart. There is wickedness in me. I'm a human. My life hasn't been perfect. And I thank God that he looked at me and was like, I want that one, and I'm going to have her, <laughs> and I'm just so grateful. I'm just so grateful. He is so good. 
He has kept me. He's kept me fed, clothed. He's kept me alive. He's kept me safe. I look back on some of that stuff I did. I'm like, girl, what was you out here doing? You could have been in a ditch somewhere, cut up to pieces, just out in these streets. Living my best life, what I thought. No, 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 no. God's hand was on me. His angels protected me. He's been so good. He has been so good. And, and looking back, I'm like, oh, God was really good to me. But once I gave my life to him, man, the goodness went up several levels. <laughs> so God's goodness, you know, that scripture says he reigns on the just as well as the unjust. And, and to me, I would say what that means is breath in our bodies. So everybody that's alive has experienced God's goodness and grace. They just don't know it. You alive because he said you can exist. That's him raining on you, that you have breath in your body. You can move your limbs. You can eat, sleep, got a place to stay in a job. But for the ones who are his children is abundant life for us. Not just the basics, because he meets everybody's basic needs, but we get more than that. And so that's a lot to be thankful for. I am so grateful to be here with my church family to talk about Palm Sunday and to give God praise. Jesus deserves it all. We sung the song, he's the only one worthy. He is the only one worthy, and I will go to my grave saying that. Can't nobody tell me different. He is the only one worthy, and I'm so grateful and so thankful for all he's done for me and for what I've seen him do in, in everybody else's life. He's just so good, you guys. So get up here, take this mic. It's not as scary as you think it is. We're with family. Let's tell of the goodness of God and encourage each other for this upcoming week. I love you guys so much. Man, I don't like talking on the microphone. <sighs> but I was telling Tricia back there, I don't think I can hold it in. I've got to tell y'all about how faithful my God is. Hmm. So I lost my job in November, at the end of November. It was, a, it was an okay season. <laughs> um, I learned what I needed to learn. I learned a lot of great things. Um, but I knew it was time for that season to be over. But at the same time, being unemployed in this economy... Uh, being un unemployed at all, honestly. But I was I was so happy at that time. Uh, right at uh, right at the end of when I lost my job, I was happy. I was like, this weight has been lifted. I don't have to deal with that anymore. It was hard. Um, but then I went through this hard season of trying to find something. I felt lost. I felt frustrated. And there's been many tears and prayers and confusion and frustration and anger <laughs> um, because I just didn't know what God was doing. Where are you? I've been asking for this. I apply for this job, turn down. I apply for this job, turn down. I apply for this job that I think is going to be great. And it's in, it was in Benton and it was going to be as closely as I thought I could get to my career that I'm working towards in school. Got an interview. People were great. They moved forward with other candidates. Man, I was devastated. Uh, I was like, if I can't get that job, what am I supposed to do? I can't go work at McDonald's. I can't support my family with that. Part-time, minimum wage. That can't support anybody, honestly. Not, not with this economy. My first paycheck, or the whole month's worth of work, it would be just rent. <laughs> yeah, I hear some witnesses, people know, like, it's just, as soon as you get a paycheck, it's gone. And I was like, I can't do that. God, you, there's got to be more. There's got to be more than that. Man. <clears throat> and then March, the first Monday of March, I don't know what day that was, the fourth? I don't know. Um, well, I applied for a job at the end of February. Um, and I was like, well, I fit the requirements. But in past experience, like, they'll move forward with other candidates. They'll hire internally, you know, whatever. But, hey, I fit these requirements. Go for it. And then the following Monday, 
I think that was a, that was a Sunday, and then the next Monday, I got a call for an interview. I was like, okay. Got a call for me an interview. It was that Friday. Um, it was so Friday the eighth. I know that was the. I know. The, well, I know what that day that was. It was a Friday the eighth. Went in for the interview. And the first question, and all the rest of the questions are right out of the gate, was stuff I had just been studying in school for counseling. All about um, substance abuse models and treatment plans and intakes and all that stuff. I was like, I did an assignment on that. I know how to talk about that. <laughs> and um, they seemed impressed. They um, seemed happy that I was applying for the job. Um, they said they have other candidates to interview and they'll get back with me. I said, okay, well, I've heard that before. Um, you'll probably move forward with other candidates. You know, they're just doing what they're supposed to do legally. And then, so that was Friday and Tuesday morning. They called me and said I was the top candidate. <laughs> and... <laughs> She said, are you interested? Yes, I'm interested, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the next morning, uh, she told me to go to HR at 10. Went to HR. Friday, they said, everything's good. You want to start on Monday? All within like two and a half weeks from hearing about an interview to starting my job. <laughs> and so when I started my job, that was this past Monday. So I had a whole week this week of working, well, Training, training, but you know, being in the office and everything. And the people are hilarious. The, my boss is so laid back and welcoming, checking in on me. Told me multiple times she's so excited that I started. Um, just so different from my other job. And um, my coworker, I share an office with um, two other counselors. And like I said, they're hilarious. We played baseball in the office on Friday. The rolled up piece of paper in a paper towel tube. <laughs> it was just, it was just, it's just such a fun atmosphere working with the inmates. I got to talk to a few of them. Um, it's at a correctional facility, but I didn't mention that. But um, the correctional facility right off the highway, off, off of 5:30, that you can see. Um, and talking with the inmates and everything, they're great guys. Um, they're excited. They're excited that I'm here. You know. It's, um, and being able to see the other counselors work already, um, just you know, throughout the week, watching them do what they do, what I'm going to be doing, it's 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 crazy how happy I am just sitting there watching what I'm about to do. And it's starting my career in counseling way before than I thought. So not only did the Lord deliver a great job, but it's starting my career that I wanted years before I thought I was going to be able to do anything. What? So let me tell you, I just want to encourage you for a minute because I have been messed up this week about his goodness and his faithfulness. If you're in a season where you are waiting, he's working in your waiting, okay? He's working in your waiting. If you feel like he's not there, you haven't heard nothing, you keep getting turned down, you keep losing, you keep, you keep getting hit while you're down, he is working. And it takes patience being in that season of waiting. It takes patience. And that patience requires faithfulness. And that faithfulness requires patience. It goes hand in hand. But let me tell you, that wait is worth it. If you want happiness in your life, you're covered in all this sadness, depression, whatever you want, whatever you want to put there. If you want happiness, satisfaction in your life, fulfillment in your life, you can, sometimes you have to wait for it. But that wait is so worth it. What you think is going to be perfect for you is not perfect for you. God knows what's perfect for you. Because that other job in December in Benton that I applied for, this has to be perfect. This is it. I attached myself to that job and it was ripped away. Because that's not what I thought was perfect for me was not. I had no idea that this job was going to be perfect for me. Because I was like, oh, I, can, I fit some requirements and maybe I can do something with it. But God was like, yeah, you're going to do something with it. <laughs> The wait is worth it. The wait is worth it. It's hard. It's hard. But it's so worth it watching God be able to come in with that goodness and that faithfulness in your life. 
The Lord is so good to us. The, the enemy tried to take us out many times, but he protected us. The Lord protected us. And um, I, he been providing me transportation backwards and forth to work because, uh, you know, NT, NCTR is far from Pine Bluff District, and I've been always having a way home and there and home. He's just been so good to us, faithful to us. I just want to say he's a good God. <laughs> Well, um, for the last several months, probably going back to maybe October, I've been dealing with some foot pain. And the, the, it's not my Achilles, but it was an attendant on the outside of my heel, and it would flare up, and I'd limp around. Even at work, they'd be, you know, you're doing all right. I was like, i got to hitch in my giddy-up, you know, and just <laughs> move on, because that's, you know. Sorry, I keep it real. Um, and um, here back in February, it got inflamed, and I'm limping bad. And my mom's like, you need to go to the doctor and get that looked at. And I'm like, no, I, I don't want to go to the doctor. <laughs> and, I, and I've been praying for myself privately, and I'm sure, you know, not that she hadn't been praying for me too, but I'm a little, little hard-headed. And uh, the last... Tuesday in February, we had our monthly elders meeting, and we'll keep it real, it was a long day at work, and the text, and Justin's like, we don't have a big meeting, we're just going to pray, and I'm like, oh, I could stay home, I'm tired, you know, it's, you know, we're human, but I came in, and we had and talked, and I was like, okay, and it was I was limping pretty good. I was having some issues. I'm like, okay, I'll tell them. So that that night, we I, I sat up here and the elders of the church and they they laid hands and prayed for me and it was still sore when I left. The next morning, it was about seventy percent better. It was still a little sore, but I can tell you, on this past Wednesday. I mowed the yard, and it takes me about 45 minutes to an hour of walking, and when I got done, my mom was even over. She came over for dinner, and I'm like, my heel doesn't hurt. But the week before that, Aubrey and I went and played tennis. Now, I did tell her I'm not going to be quite as aggressive because, you know, God's a healer, but who wants to press their luck, right? <laughs> but... We uh, played tennis when I got home. It was a little sore because that's, you know, stop and go. That's different than walking forward. But um, God's a healer. And uh, I'm standing up here. I hadn't limped any. It doesn't hurt any. And uh, sometimes you can pray for yourself and it gets, gets done. And sometimes you need to have other people lay hands on you and get it done. But uh, don't give up because he can get it done. Yeah. So six months ago, uh, me, me and my children became homeless. Um, after the deliverance, God started removing some things that I couldn't remove, and, and, and everything was, was stirring up, and there was a lot of stirring up, and I didn't know what was going on. So six months ago, we became homeless. Three months ago, a house dropped in my lap. I was praying without ceasing. That's where I'm going with this. Praying without ceasing. So I was putting so much faith in, in the Lord, and I was just praying and praying. This house fell in our house. We, I mean, my, our lap. We moved in. We were on pallets, like literally two blankets on the floor, y'all. Two blankets. When I tell you, oh, and unemployed. No way to pay the bills. Waiting on an income tax check. Going to get everything. Sh but I had faith. I was like, I don't care. I, I, I'll, get in, I'll pay everything up with the taxes, and something's going to happen. Month one goes by. No job. Like, okay, God, I know, okay, I know what you've done for me last year. So, and I'm just, I'm just praying and I'm just praying, God, I know. So long story short, here we are, uh, three months later, I got a house full of stuff. I got recliner, I got furniture, I got beds, and, and I go today to pick up my work schedule. So that's what he's done recently. I'm 
I know y'all probably think I like this, but I don't. Me and Jesus fight a lot in church. <laughs> um, God's just really been going through uh, the story of my little girl's life, sitting back there looking at her brother back there on the next to the back row. Um, recently, he really put on my heart, and I've shared with some small groups of people, of kind of a twist on looking for the devil in the bushes of how anytime something bad happens to us or something's not going good, I've always, you know, heard it preached. And, and it's true that we're so busy looking for the devil in the bushes and it might be our flesh. It might be something that we need to confess or we need to kind of deal with in our lives. It's not always him causing something sort of a thing. But in a twist to that, the Lord was telling me, I do want you to start reading into everything, but in a good way. So when you're blessed with something, I want you to look and see and step back and really assess the situation and be like, would this normally have happened? How did this come about? So that you can see my hand. You can see the fingerprints of what I've done. And she's one of the best examples of that. So um, she's a rainbow baby. I don't, for anybody that doesn't know what that is, that's a baby born um, after a mother has lost a baby. So I lost uh, a, a, a baby boy before her, between Ethan and her. And when I was pregnant with her, um, actually just through the Lord talking to me is how I came up with her middle name. And um, while her middle name is pretty and it's a nice name, it's Faith. It was literally because I was struggling so hard around every corner to enjoy her and my pregnancy with her and kind of getting to know her during that time that time of anyone who's ever carried a child, you know how special and exciting that is. But I couldn't, like I just couldn't really release and enjoy that because the whole time I'm like, I'm going to get to know this person and then they're going to be gone. But I was getting to know her and I was telling my mom in her kitchen that God had promised me that this one was going to make it and that I just had to have faith. And as soon as I said that, I was like, that's her middle name and that's why her middle name is that, to remind me that he had already provided it and he had already promised it, but I just had to have the faith. So I get to enjoying my pregnancy. And we go a little ways down the road. And a lot of you know that I've dealt with uh, Crohn's disease through a lot of my, or most of my adult life. And the nice thing that um, my old gastroenterologist, so actually my new one as well, are both believers. And I remember him telling me that pretty much it was like God's way, you know, medically they wouldn't say it that way, but usually when you have an autoimmune illness, a lot of times your body will go into remission to protect that baby, to protect that pregnancy. And if that um, illness kicks in and starts being active, it can attack that baby and it can force your body to abort that baby because it'll start to see that baby as an invader to your immune system. Well, normally my gastroenterologist was one of the top ones in the entire state. He was always like the TED Talk guy, the keynote speaker, top of his game. And I'm the only one he had ever had, the only patient he had ever had that started flaring really bad in the middle of my pregnancy with her. So then, of course, I'm fearful again and thinking, this is going to take her out. So we prayed over it, thankfully. Like I said, he was a believer, but also from a medical standpoint, we decided to opt for the lesser of two evils and go ahead and put me on a bunch of steroids. That would possibly suppress the reaction, protect her, and then try to help me be as healthy as possible through the rest of the pregnancy. So we fast forward to the day that she was born, when she wasn't supposed to be yet. <laughs> um, so my mom had taken me for a, a small surgery to have something removed from one of my fingers in Little Rock. And we were on our way back to town, still in Little Rock, right up by Children's Hospital. And someone had decided to park in the lane we were in facing us to help someone on the side of the road instead of getting on the shoulder. Well, they teared off after the wreck happened, but mom stopped in plenty of time. The people behind us stopped, but there was a lady behind them in a big dually truck that was going 70 miles an hour when she hit that minivan and vaulted them into our car. And mom had like a little, min a little Ford Fiesta, I think, a little bitty small car. So it didn't provide a lot of uh, protection, I guess, from being thrown around. So um, 
Lena was real low. Anybody that's had a baby, you know, she's, she's kind of engaging, but she wasn't making any progress yet. But she was exactly four weeks early. And where her head was laying was where my seatbelt was. Like, no matter how low I wore my seatbelt at that point, um, if what physics says would have happened when that car hit us, she would have been dead. Or at best, seriously, brain damage, probably a vegetable for the rest of her life if she had lived. But my seat broke. And instead of going like this, my body went like this. And everything on me was in the trunk. So I didn't think uh, too terribly much about that at the moment. But we fast forward, we get to the hospital. She's born. Very, it was a very traumatic thing because it wasn't my hospital. They didn't know me. A lot of stuff that going on with that. Well, she was born. We know she's early. She comes out screaming, absolutely screaming at the top of her lungs. And I kept looking, and they never put an ounce of oxygen on her. And that's not heard of. Well, then somebody starts asking me, was she, were you already preterm? Like she was trying to come already, like they've been giving you shots. And I was like, no. And they said, she's acting like someone who's had these steroids that they give you when you start going into early labor to develop their lungs. And I was like, well, I've been on steroids, but not those kind. So the coincidence, that wasn't a coincidence, is that flare up that doesn't happen caused me to get on steroids to develop her lungs as a unknown side effect that made her be okay when she was born. And I didn't know that wreck was gonna happen, but I knew that God did. So he had started protecting her all the way back then. So then we fast forward, I had to have a C-section with her and they had already told me at that hospital, you minimum had to stay 36 hours if you have a C-section, period. Like, they won't let you go even if everything's perfect. Well, they went ahead and came in early, like the next morning, and they did the car seat test on her. They just had to make sure that they're mature enough in their lungs and physically okay enough to ride home, basically. So they did the car test on her, and it's pretty strenuous once I figured out what it was. She passed with flying colors. And we hadn't even been there 24 hours yet. So next thing I know, less than 24 hours later, after they had done my x-rays to see what was broken and what wasn't and all of that, and with her never needing any extra intervention, we went home. And then the last piece of it <coughs> is when I went with my mom, and I think my ex-husband maybe, but I know I went with my mom to Jean Campbell's body shop to go see her car. And I, we were trying to make sure anything that was maybe still in there because it was being totaled, or we thought it was something, anyway. And I'm just looking through, and I sat down in the seat where I had been sitting when the wreck happened. And the seat was laid backwards, and I was like, that was just so amazing, like how I didn't even, even with the seat going backwards, how I didn't go forward. And even if I had just been straight up and just kind of pushed back, and I did, I felt like something pushed me from the front. And I do think the Lord sent an angel to, to push me and hold me backwards. And I said, well, this, this broken seat, well, without even thinking about it, I pulled the handle on that seat and it sat straight up and it held. That seat was not broken and nothing had happened to that seat. But that little girl, I don't know what's in store for her life, but she was definitely meant to be here. <laughs> and God guided and protected her every step of the way. And I just had to have that faith. So anything that you guys are going through, just see those good things and read into them. Don't, don't think of coincidence. Look and see at how that would not be probable, how the Lord's hand is in each of those things. Nervous, so bear with me. Um, I want to talk about, I guess, a few different things. Um, first, I just want to touch on what my mom talked about with Lena. Um, she didn't point that out, um, which is why it kind of made me start crying. Um, but when I first started going to school, at five years old, of course, because that's when you start going to school normally, kindergarten, 
I went to Ridgeway Christian School. And every morning, my mom dropped me off at school. And um, every morning, for years and years and years, until she was born when I was six years old, because we're six years apart, me and my mom prayed for a little sister. And when my mom talked about why she made her middle name Faith, I had faith that he would give me a little sister because I prayed for her day and day and day and day and day because I wanted to be that big brother that would do anything for that little girl back there. And so he gave me her to help make me the person that I am today because of my mother and all the parents that I have because you know, I have my stepdad back there and I have my dad and I have my stepmom. And I've been blessed to have four, unlike some that might not have any. And um, so I'm just thankful for her back there. And more recently, um, not super recent, but kind of recent. Some of you may not know. Um, but I'm only 19. Um, I'll be 20 in August. Um, but... The Lord has blessed me a lot financially, um, more than I can ever, ever fathom, honestly. Um, but I'm 19 years old, and December, as of last year, I officially paid off and own, in my name, three and a half acres of land for $12,000. And I am currently saving and working on either putting a trailer on there or building a tiny home to start my life and move down to where it's at, at which it happens to be less than five minutes from my parents' house. So we're right next door. Um, and then another thing that he's done for me really, really recently, actually a few of y'all that were at my house, I think last Saturday probably know about it. Um, but I recently, September as of last year, I started working as a um, security guard at the jail downtown. It's the county jail. It's called Dub Brazel. And um, I've been a guard there since September 6th. And my goal is to be there till September of this year and then go become a guard at the arsenal. And because um, you have to have a year's worth of experience in some sort of field like that in order to get the job. And um, since about December, um, I've been working with just me and my lieutenant by myself, taking care of the jail at night from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. with about 230-something inmates by myself. And pretty much anything that's done other than intake, I do. I deal with them 24-7. I have nothing but pepper spray. So God's blessed me there that I haven't been harmed at all. Um, they all show me respect, and I show them respect. Um, because they're humans too, and God loves them too. I love when I walk into a room and they're reading their Bibles or they're telling me about Jesus and what he's done for them. And they're in a not so great situation and they're still being thankful for something. But besides that, um, I got asked, like I said, I've been working for about three months now by myself pretty much with no other help. And... Um, I recently got asked, which of course, like Daniel said earlier, yes, of course I want it, but that I recently got promoted. I got a big promotion to the next, next rank up. I was, started out as a deputy, and I recently got promoted to corporal. Now, I don't know what pay increase that becomes. I'll hopefully see that in the next check or two, because they did officially update my payroll, so I should be seeing that as well. Um, but I just want to thank him for that and make that known because there's people that I've worked with that were on my shift that are still deputies and because of what I've done and the hard work that I've put in and at first I was sitting there like why? Why am I having to go through this? Why am I having to struggle and be the only person here and everybody else gets to quit or go to a different shift because they don't want to work this shift because the lieutenant makes them upset or whatever the case may be and not just has my bond with that lieutenant that at first I did not like grown but it opened my eyes to the fact that he was making an opportunity for me because I made it to corporal faster than probably anybody there that I've seen make it to corporal or that is still a deputy themselves. And 
So he put me in that place, whether I realized it at first or not, he definitely put me there. And um, I've definitely been thinking on it a lot because, you know, like I said, it's, I was originally thinking, why? Why am I here? I don't really want to be here. I'm really just doing this for the next job. But I've been more than blessed already while being there and been well taken care of. And a lot of them guys, inmates in there, have told me that they're, they're protecting me as well, whether I know it or not. So. There we go. I'm not going to be long, because uh, if I do go long, I'll probably cry anyways. But um, as most of you know, uh, you know, last year around this time, Kristen uh, miscarried. Um, I wasn't even going to come up here anyways. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but now she's pregnant, praise the Lord. Um, but yeah, around this time last year, uh, we had a miscarriage and, you know, the due date, um, for the baby was going to be like in November or so. And I think it was, uh, pretty cool how, um, around that same time, which we, we found out she was pregnant on December 10th, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> but obviously, um, she probably got pregnant in November around the due date of that, you know, the baby is supposed to be born then. So how ironic is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And then um, we find out the, uh, the gender last week. Um, and that's around the same time that we had the miscarriage. So I just think that, you know, that's a really cool testimony about, testimony about the Lord's faithfulness. And, um, it's just amazing how blessed we are and how blessed our family is. And we're excited and nervous at the same time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop. Well, I just want to thank the Lord for my children. And as I was thinking about Palm Sunday... And how they were shouting Hosanna and how they made Jesus king for a day. And then later they were crying out, crucify him. I just want to thank you, Lord, that my children didn't make you king for a day. <laughs> they made you king of their heart. And as parents, that's what we long to see. We do our part. He, he gives us these treasures, and we get to do our part in raising them up. And, and we want to be godly parents. But I'm just so thankful that even in mine and Robert's weakness and, and brokenness and times of failure in our parenting, that God is so faithful. He's so faithful. And um, I'm just so proud of my sons and their beautiful wives because God graced us with beautiful daughter-in-laws. And I'm just going to prophesy right now that God is going to raise my little Savannah up. And she's, she's not going to just have Jesus king for a day. <laughs> she's going to have Jesus king of her heart also. And she's a gift She's a little treasure to our family. And God knew that we wanted a little Savannah. And we struggled and we couldn't have that third child. Oh, but Jesus had a plan. He had a plan. And he gave us that little princess. And God is just so faithful. And so when we commit things to the Lord, he is faithful to finish those good things that he starts so I just had to praise him. I just had to praise him for my children and his faithfulness and my grandchildren. Our quiver is definitely full. <laughs> Amen. All right. Oh, now I know how you all feel when I'm crying. I enjoy the tears. Um, I just 
want to uh, thank the Lord for for his word that says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and that with God anything is possible that's what I'm seeing uh, about three weeks ago uh, yeah, this morning I just asked Miss Helen to pray with me because I was just I've been feeling that that urge again to win souls you know that's part of my desire to see people come to Christ and I want that passion to grow and, and anyway one day I was um, approximately three weeks ago I was working on my carport which is a different story and I was praying for my neighbors because I'm thinking like my neighborhood you know where I live at it's like I tell everybody that comes there new that I tell them I'm the police of this area I'm the policeman of my neighborhood I mean because I'm looking out for you and then I would say I want you to do the same so I tell them that <laughs> but anyway I was praying for my neighbor and I was asking the Lord for an opportunity so that I could witness to him because this guy sells stuff and okay so and then that same day he came over and he asked me for a ride to go to the store and I thought wow look at it right there so I've been practicing some new ways to witness to people you know I, I learned a few years ago that Jesus said that we are supposed to be like uh, uh, as calm as a dove and as why is a serpent? And I learned that a serpent can watch its prey for approximately almost like anywhere from four to eight hours. So I've been kind of watching my neighbors. <laughs> I've been watching people. <laughs> like, because you know, so that's interesting. And I saw that one day I saw a snake and that snake was watching me for like at least two hours. Because I, you know, but anyway, so the Lord gave me an opportunity to, to get to know my neighbor. He's, he's a new guy in the area. So, but it's just that open door. I think that's what I wanted to say, that open door. Like I was saying, Lord, give me an opportunity. Because, you know, sometimes I'm shy. As, as bold as I am sometimes, I'm still shy. But I'm overcoming that part. I'm overcoming those areas in my life. That's why we're, and, and Teresa said something about level, you know. We have different realms in the spirit that God wants to take us into. But, you know, that was that open door fresh again for me to, to talk to people because, you know, people need to know what's, what's getting ready to happen. And then the next testimony I want to share is God has been helping me with my abilities because that's part of me, like, I come from that background that my family, they are carpenters, they, they know different trades. And this week, for the first time, I plumbed a house. <laughs> I just thought that was cool because I, I pretty much did it by myself. Like, I learned how to run plumbing water under a house. That's, that was a big thing because I learned how to roof a whole house. So I thank God for helping me with my abilities. And um, I thank God for you guys praying for me to put that fire back inside of me to win souls. Amen. We've heard some stories of some victories. Amen. More to come. Greater things are still to come. God did it before. He's going to do it again. So we love you guys. You can stay and worship if you want. If you need to be dismissed quietly, that's okay. Prayer teams will be available.